Uh, so hi everybody, thanks for coming. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, video coding for machines, uh, the research part of it, and then the standardization part of it. I hope it can interest some of you. Uh, yeah, so first of all, I was here between 2008 and 2011 for my PhD thesis, uh, together with uh, Thompson, then Technicolor, <laughs> then the Digital. Uh, yeah, and uh, Luis kind, kindly um, hired me as a, an engineer something after my thesis, yeah. Um, then I did a couple of postdocs, one in Germany, and I came back here in 2014-ish um, at Technicolor. Uh, and then I moved to the U.S. in 2018 in another lab of the same company. Uh, so yeah, if you guys uh, want to know more about uh, into digital and all that, we can we can talk after the after the presentation. Okay, so this is I hope it is here. Uh, so video coding for machines it's it's very recent and. Uh, yeah, again, you can see two aspects of it, the research that maybe interests you. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm first I'm going to talk about like, what is the what is the problem, what we want to do with this? And in the second time, I will talk about uh, standards and standards is a little different because you're not just looking for performance, you're also looking for deployment and having something that's, uh, that can be used by majority of people who want to deploy such pipelines. So first, um, yeah, why? So we have like cameras that are limited in resources, like IoT, smartphones, things like this. And you may want to um, compute your vision model remotely uh, on a cloud, in the net, like in your network, different parts of the of, of remote servers. Um, and example cases are um, video surveillance, uh, smart cities like cars, communicate communicating with uh, cloud all with each other and some like for instance farming uh, new methods that rely on um, on uh, monitoring what's happening with uh, with your your plan so you have many different tasks uh, I'm guessing you know all of them like object detection segmenting the objects classification of images then you have some more complicated tasks like uh, face recognition, detection of emotions and stuff. Uh, pose estimation, as you can guess, also requires a lot of, of computations. And um, the cameras that we use, they are often embedded in devices, IoT, phones, and they are very limited. So you you can have two, two solutions and those solutions can be combined. You can do what is called edge computing, which is you train your network so that it can run on the phone. That's perfect. But sometimes it's not enough. So Second idea is you offload the compute to a remote server. And again, it can be cloud, like far away, but it can also be a nearby devices or um, the edge of the network. I'm going to talk about uh, those pipelines separately because they are treated separately uh, in, in research and in standards. So the first one, I just talked about it. it, it it's like you can, do everything on your mobile phone, let's say. So you have the result of your prediction directly on your mobile phone. You can transmit it if needed, but if you directly need it on your phone, no need for transmission. Then we have what we call remote computing. In that case, what you compress is the video directly or an image, and you decode an image. You're gonna run your task on the decoded pixels, right? At MPEG, that's what we call video coding for machines, so VCM. Of course, maybe you need the, the feedback, the, the prediction back to your phone. So in that case, you transmit it back. And the last one is uh, split computing or split inferencing. This one we call feature coding for machines because now the input of your, uh, of your codec is um, uh, the intermediate features of a neural network, right? So you, you perform a part of your model vision on your phone and the rest of the model, what I call NN part two, it's, it's going to be uh, performed remotely. Offloading, it looks like amazing, but it comes at a cost. Of course, you have uh, latency, um, um, 
um, that's the worst um, thing that we're going to look at because if you want some like quick feedback, let's say you want to to have an, an autonomous car and you're talking 5G with a remote server, uh, it's going to be the latency is going to be critical and you, you don't want your car to have like even milliseconds of, of delay. Uh, but some applications are fine with um, with this latency. So it's going to be, you know, that in compression, we have always this trade-off um, um, accuracy or um, quality versus bitrate. We, we're going to also have an, another one that is latency versus performance. Um, there are things that we cannot, as like engineers working on the compression system, there are things we cannot touch. Uh, the latency of the 5G ecosystem is something that I'm taking for granted, but at least we can look at the runtime of the encode, the decode. Uh, we know how much data will transmit, uh, like peak energy, things like this. Obviously, um, the, the people that need this kind of pipelines, they're not going to wait for MPEG to tell them how to do it. So, like, so it's 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 currently done, and you use the existing. What you what do you have? If you look at the video coding for machines, what you can do is you encode. You use traditional codecs. It's it's not going to be perfect, but you you can do it, and you perform the task on the on the reconstructed pixels. The drawbacks are that those uh, codecs are not optimized for machine tests. They are optimized for us. So that the artifacts that are um, hidden for our, our, our human eyes, they're not the ones that may work well with the machine tasks. Um, I'm looking at some artifacts like uh, ringings and, and things like this, it might completely destroy the accuracy of, of, of your machine task. And um, the second, like the, the last one I have, is uh, we've always looked at the energy or the complexity of the decoder because traditionally we had like TV systems uh, decoding happens on your on your limited device, but now this is completely different. the The encoder is in your IoT or your smartphone, right? Uh, the decoder is on the cloud, so technically you could even think of the opposite, at least maybe symmetric, but you could think of having even more computed the decoder. In terms of research, uh, you can find even more than uh, what, what I know. So uh, it's been a, just machine to machine communication has been a hot topic for a long time, not only video, but like for the industry, checking if some machines have some vibrations and will need maintenance soon and things like this, It's it's been. But for image and video, it's fairly recent. I would say 2018. Uh, people have started to put together pipeline of video codecs and machine tests. Um, yeah, and so there are a couple of workshops uh, that were initiated this year. A colleague is uh, yeah, um, sharing a new workshop, uh, IEEE, that uh, I think it goes together with ICME. Um, and yeah, so what you will find in research is, of course, like the the promises of those approaches. So they're going to look at performance, um, putting some like end-to-end -end, um, train systems and so on, but that might not be what a standard is looking at. But, uh, the standard wants to deploy systems that can be agnostic, it can be interoperable. And I'm going to touch that in the, in the next section. Um, very quickly on Remote, what we would call remote analysis, which is the video coding for machine. So again, we decode pixels and we perform the task on the on the decoded pixel. And we saw there are like the big big pros if you already deployed, let's say I don't know, HEVC everywhere, you can reuse it directly. So that's a that's a big plus, except for us because we want to deploy new standards to make money. <laughs> um, and the, the drawbacks, we I, I already talked about them actually. And I make an MPEG VCM. Of course, the, the pros is you're not enabling something new, but you, you can perform way better than even VVC. If you 
if you know your end task, maybe you don't need the background. Maybe you, you want to. I'm, I I just want to know that this is called. Uh, I can already segment and not transmit the rest of the windows and things like this. So even by reusing VVC in a smart manner, you, you, you're you going to um, uh, have huge uh, gains. What we tried the first time um, uh, with my team was to uh, just put together a trained end-to-end -end auto encoder, put the task um, after uh, decoding, and train everything end-to-end. -end. Like, let's see. Can I train instead of training for MSE or the like PSNL or some like human vision metrics? Just the accuracy of the output task and the gradients go back all the all the way. Of course, we got some huge gains, and it comes at the cost of deploying a new codec that would be end to end. Uh, as you can imagine, complexity, um, all the system things that are not ready for such approaches. Uh, are going to impact us big time. And now the, the second approach, we decided to focus on this one because I'm going to talk a little bit later, but this one, the split model, we feel like there's, it enables new applications. The first one feels like you just need to be better than VVC. This one, you encode features, it's kind of new. It, it can uh, create new pipelines with the split inferencing thing. And uh, we feel like the switch for people to use a new standard is not easier, but at least there's something when you enable new applications that, that, that makes it easier. Yeah. In research, people have looked at um, how you can split models the, the best way by looking at the architectures of the models, of course. Like if you look at um, what they call a natural entropy bottleneck. You can you can find layers. I mean, the uh, the intermediate output of some layers that are directly small in terms of number of samples. So of course, when you want to compress them, it's going to be easier. Um, and uh, people have done it with like big models, um, smaller models. Thing is, at some point, when you want to create a new standards, you need to um, to at least take a, like a couple of use cases that you can iterate on. And so um, the MPEG decided to take uh, one of those approaches, uh, uh, um, the RCNN models that I'm gonna present this uh, in the next, uh, in the next uh, sections. Uh, but before, uh, just to make sure we understand what it is, if you have an original network, if you if you do what I say, you can you can modify and retrain the whole chain, right? Or you can just introduce a codec in the middle, like kind of agnostic of what's happening left and right. Um, but in that case, that means that you fix the the model. We call it pre-trained. We we freeze it. You can still maybe train end to end, but uh, you freeze this part of, of, of the model. So in terms of standards, okay, this is not very interesting for you guys, but uh, just to show that uh, it's 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 a little bit everywhere, which is why it's interesting for us because it's not just MPEG. We see that there's things happening in the 3GPP world which may uh, look good in terms of like the probability of deployment of such things. Um, and but in in MPEG, that's where we also. Well, some of you guys know, but um, ISO is a very big, big, big structure with like um, like small groups. And um, for those who are interested, I know one is interested. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it split MPEG. It, it, it was split in like different working groups. Uh, the first one is for steel images. It's JPEG AI uh, for the AI deep learning based technologies. In WG2, you have all the experimental stuff, but now at the last meeting, so last week, uh, the F feature coding formation, so what I just presented, the split inference, moved to a working group that is actually going to uh, work on, um, a deep, uh, I mean, at least drafting a standard. Um, 
So that's the VCM, uh, again, VCM and encode pixels, I decode pixels, and I perform the task remotely. So that's what they're doing. They have um, a pipeline like this. As you can see in yellow in the middle, you can replace inner codec by, let's say, VVC, uh, standard uh, existing codec, right? And what they're doing is they have um, they have pre-processing. Uh, it, it goes back to what I said before. If I just want to recognize Carol or uh, kind of detect his emotions remotely, maybe I don't need to transmit all what I feel. Maybe I can perform a small task that will at least check its Carol and then, uh, yeah. So it's, 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 it's what's happening when you see like region of interest based processing, uh, you can I either blur or not transmit the background, things like this. So one big, difference with tradition the traditional codec is they're also looking at modifying the inner codec with encoding keyframes with learned image compression systems but it's so hard to do it for interframes like um that's the the fallback to vvc this is kind of why also i have no faith in such a um, model because i guess the some of you work in like um low level uh, and architectures of, of, of uh, embedded devices. As you can imagine, you will still need your ASIC and your dedicated hardware for uh, VVC and the interstep and your NPU or I don't know what for, for the rest of uh, for the keyframes, right? So it's going to take a lot of time to, to adopt this kind of, of things. And if you remove that, which is probable actually, you fall back to VVC plus some metadata that could tell uh, the decoder, what to do with uh, the copying or the resampling of, of, of the data. And again, um, you need to show, I don't know, like crazy performance compared to VVC if you want people to adopt a new standard for that, because other, otherwise people already paid for, for something, they're not going to change. Right now, what they have is if you just use VTM, which is the reference software for VVC, and their uh, system, on average, you you gain 27%. So that means that at same accuracy for the end task, you transmit 27% less bits. Uh, uh, yeah. And with the hybrid inner codec, which is the one with uh, learned image compression, as you can see, it goes up on average, but it looks bad for class A, which is actually the class that is the bigger resolutions. Uh, maybe some of you know, but the vision models, usually they accept some predefined sizes of images, which means that if you're looking at data sets like that, that have different resolutions, these videos are going to be upscaled or downscaled to fit the model. So it's kind of weird to talk uh, BPP, uh, bit rates per point, because in the end, the source video is being rescaled before going to the, yeah, to the mesh test. But again, as you can see here, like, I, if you tell me I need to deploy a new standard, look at all the system level uh, things I need to deploy for um, uh, learned image compression, uh, I feel like it's not there, like 15% and uh, new things. Um, yeah, plus losses that uh, high resolution. Yeah, that's, that's, that's still weird. Of course, they're, they're going to work on it. As you can see, there are some big players there. So I'm pretty confident that in one year or two, it, it, they're going to have gains and, and show uh, better uh, better performance. But uh, it comes at the high, high, high cost. Um, and again, also something I, 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 did, I did say at the beginning, but I did not um, say here, it's like VVC encoders, super heavy, right? And so if you perform VVC encoding in your limited device, uh, yeah, you also you also need to, to think twice because you might want to use, um, let's say, older generation encoders that are much faster for your IoT or your, yeah. Okay, so now just going back to this slide to make sure uh, everything is uh, right with the pipelines. I focused on this one and 
we're going to talk about this one now. Uh, so the FCM, feature coding for machines. Um, the use cases are the same. It's just the pipeline that is different. Uh, we're just thinking, okay, maybe we can extract features, transmit those features more efficiently and perform the second part of the task. Um, it's very recent. Uh, uh, it was like launched in 2020, 2021. And the call for proposals was issued in April and we actually analyzed it last, last two, two, weeks, two weeks ago. <laughs> What what do you two weeks ago? <laughs> um okay, I'm sorry, it's a little bit of uh, repetition here, but um I just want to make sure the test conditions are clear for us because you have how, like how people are gonna use this standard, but also you have what we need to to freeze such that people can iterate on the codec. And what what has been decided is we use pre-trained and then test part one and part two. We're not touching the weights, the, the, the pre-trained and, and frozen. So what we get at the, at the, as input for our encoder is uh, those tensors of features. We're gonna show what they look like right after. And, and yeah, same, and then test part two is frozen. That means that this model was trained without any constraint on how compact the intermediate features are. Let's say I have a tensor of, I don't know, 256 channels feature match. It can be that channel two looks like it's very similar to channel, I don't know, 233, which means the model doesn't care. It brings more accuracy and there is no constraint on the compactness of the match. So, uh, so our job is actually to to find those uh, redundancies back and, and compress them. This is one of the models that we use. It's, it's a model, it's a faster RCNN. Um, um, it's part of the Detectron 2 library that was uh, open source by Meta. Facebook. Um, it has like a feature generation backbone. And the split point that we consider for our system is here, which means that um, it's going to be clear on the next, but we have multiple tensors like P5, P4, P3, P2 to transmit. This is not um, ideal. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's what MPEG decided to. Pros are, um, it's very challenging. We need to compress data that is even bigger than the input videos. <laughs> so at least we know that if we can do it, we'll be good at when it comes to, to... But of course, it's kind of stupid because again, we're compressing things that are more like, noisier, uh, bigger uh, than the input videos. So it makes more sense in that case to actually yeah. transmit the video itself. It's not the only one we have. Um, we, when we respond to this MPEG call on now every three months, we're gonna have to run for four different data sets and, and um, three different models. So again, uh, just to make sure, um, if you have an original image, an original image, what you, what you need to encode now is like those four tensors that if you if you sum up the all the samples in them, it's bigger than the than the equity rate. It's so it's very it's very new, and we saw among the tw I think twelve uh, proposals, there there were three different approaches. First one was learn methods like end to end. Let's add a new bottleneck and train it uh, like you would train an autoencoder for uh, image compression. Second one is Ah, let's still use VVC uh, because we love we love VVC. So what you do is you reduce the size of the features, but still the the engine, the inner codec will be VVC. The last one is non learn methods at all, no no neural network. That's what we did, and we were an outlier in the in the process. So yeah, again, couple of things to to to, to see. We want at least 
uh, our encoder to be less complex than the NN part two. Otherwise, there's no if if the idea is to offload some compute, there's no no need to offload the compute if if the encoding is is takes longer than uh, or more energy than <coughs> in the part. One other use case that is being discussed is privacy. Um, some people believe that um, those features can like preserve your privacy. I mean, it's not like you can decode the video or it's not like you can decode the actual label that will tell you uh, something. I we have strong doubts on um, whatever reverse engineering you can do on those features. Usually they they come from convolutions and I mean, except if you really tune an architecture that creates uh, feature maps that are completely noisy, it's 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 hard to believe that you cannot do anything with those features. And if you do a good job, you will introduce a lot of noise, which is, is going to be super hard to compress. <laughs> That's what we don't like when we compress uh, content. Here, I'm going to explain why we decided not to train for now, not to use train methods. When you want to deploy something like JPEG AI, you, let's say you want to compress an image, so you have three channels, RGB or YUV. Um, you, you know your graph, right? You know that the input is three channels and you have a fully convolutional system. So you know it's agnostic to the resolution. So it, it can work with, uh, with different images. But now what we have is intermediate features. In the like we will have many different models. They're going to be even more complicated in the year, in the coming years. And we don't want the MPEG standard that compresses well for detection tool. We want something that works with all the vision models we'll have. So the problem that I, I talked about last week to the others is, okay, everything is retrained. So you have one codec for each vision model. And even for each split point, because in 3GPP, they're looking at multiple split points within the same model. That's kind of complicated for retraining, transmitting the codec together with the rest. It's doable, but it's something. And uh, what I think is the current solutions, I'm going to show one of them. When you have a convolution, you, you tell it what is the input number of channels, for instance. So that means that for another model, you're gonna to have to have a new architecture for your for your codec. It's kind of like you design a VVC that works for HD, but no other resolutions. Uh, so then they will have to work on that uh, because if you're an implementer, I guess like you uh, in this team that work on like uh, uh, designing uh, hardware architectures and. Uh, and low level codes, you want to know what is your worst case in terms of memory, what is what is the architecture. That that's that's what implementers look in the spec. And here the spec, what is left, like for the interoperability point, it's it, it's complicated. So here is the the one that had the highest performance and was chosen as a like high performance system. So yeah, bear with me, but first. You take you take your, your full tensor here, right? <laughs> it goes to this thing that um, like concatenates and 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 outputs one tensor out of four in the same in the, in the, with the same resolution. Then you have some things so that it works well with VVC. You're going to map all the different channels. Here you had C prime channels, right? So you're going to to map that onto one frame such that you can use VVC <laughs> on this packed frame. And of course, at the decoder, you really excite everything and you get back to um, the different tensors. And then that performs like uh, very good. I will show you uh, later, but uh, it, it, it gives you like, uh, I don't know, uh, I think it's like 90% uh, bitrate reduction compared to the anchor. Um, 
it's, it's what, what is the anchor? Anchor is oh yeah, sorry. Anchor is kind of doing that with VVC, but without uh, all of this. That means you take your input, you put it on a big, 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 big frame, okay? You you of course you quantize, so you take min and max on the data set, you fit that to 10 bits, and you encode that with um VVC on a monochrome frame, which is uh, YUV four zero zero means that it's just a Y one component. Yeah. Is it compared to the to just using VVC to convert the original image? Yeah, so we it, it's we have those two curves. The, the two anchors are <coughs> VVC performed on the feature labs, and we have a video anchor that is VVC on the input. Of course, the anchor on the feature lab is lower than the input, but still, this performs better than uh, the video input. But it's, uh, it's only for one image or it's for a video? Uh, we have two types of data sets, uh, but it's mostly video. There's one data set that is uh, open images. We do detection and object uh, segmentation. Mm -hmm. But the three others are videos. So Tencent video data set and one data set called High Eve. It's for object tracking. Mm -hmm. And SFU, uh, which is Simon Fraser University in Vancouver. Uh, it's again now a colleague of mine who you met last week. Uh, they are in um, they published um, a data set that is they took the the test set from HEVC time so YUV videos and they annotated it so now you can do object detection on videos. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but uh, what you present here is a uh, is only for for one image. Uh, this thing not really because it's just like all of this can be done image by image. But then you run VVC here. Okay. So VVC, you take advantage of its like uh, very good uh, interdependency kind of thing. Okay. So the prediction works well, even if it looks like no, like if you're on the right. Yeah. Well, if you but because if you look at those uh, videos, unfortunately I don't have that in my presentation, but the as you can imagine, the motions are very very small, like. Because you have very very small types of of uh, textures, yeah. Motion in intra prediction might not work as well because if you have a feature map here that looks like this one, except the two called intra block copy, it's kind of hard to find the redundancies far away in the same frame. But inter frame is, it works very well, yeah. And now that's what we did, which has no uh, VVC in it and no uh, no no trained methods. Uh, but at least we what we wanted is have to have a baseline on top of which people can can work. It's uh, tensor by tensor, uh, and um, we be we believe that this could be kind of a ground thing, and then you, we can build stuff on top. So no. What we did is we reused some methods that were uh, designed for NNC. So MPEG and NC was the is the standard for compressing neural networks, the tensors of parameters of neural networks, right? So what they did is they adapted the, um, the arithmetic coding engine for, for this specific thing. And what we believe is that those feature maps, those tensors, kind of look more like tensors of Weights of a neural network than actual pixels. Um, results are not so so good, but what we lack, of course, is uh, uh, the special redundancies because Quebec is just going to look at the the next pixel, whereas VVC has a lot of tools to to handle um, like blocks and and the prediction and so on. Uh, I'm just going to detail like each block one by one very, very quickly. Um, so first we noticed that it was fairly easy to group channels that were very similar in, even if they are far away in the in the in the tensor. So what we do is we have this like uh, 
grand matrix that tells us like the yeah what what the the, the similar uh, channels in this uh, in the tensor. So what we do is we cluster, and uh, we separate the tensor into two um, two sets of channels. We we have the bigger groups here that we identified, and what we do is we transmit only one representative channel per group. So we kind of reduce the number of channels. So we, let's say we have 31 groups. That means we transmit 31 uh, representative channels. But some of the others, either they, they're very unique or they belong to small groups and it makes sense to transmit them. We call them self-coded. And in that case, we, we transmit them. And then we have also a very sparse odd like rate distortion optimization that decides whether we can perform those scaling or not. Um, of course, what we need to transmit in addition to, to the channels themselves is what we decided. So we decided we call that coding, coding modes. So minus one would, would be it's self-coded and all the, all the numbers uh, are just the, the index such that when you reconstruct your tensor, you can check like, does it belong to a group? In that case, I fetch these values. Other than that, I, I'm just decoding. Then we noticed that something that uh, the vision model uh, likes is um, good DC or mean value of each channel. If you look at the tensor, it's fairly centered. Uh, usually it's like very close to zero, the, the average value of the whole tensor. But channel by channel, it's not, as you can see here. Um, so what we decided is, OK, let's center those channels. Um, and transmit the average value of the channel with a much higher quality. So that means a lower QP, a quantization uh, parameter. So now what we, what we need to transmit with Kabak is three different payloads, the center channels, because we remove the, the DC, the actual DC. So if we have, let's say, 256 channels, we have a vector of 256, and um, the coding loops. And all of them, I feed them to uh, the Quebec, so I quantize them, and I uh, I use the engine that was designed by um, um, the group at uh, your NNC. So that's the codec for your network compression. And what we have is something that is so again um, for Carol, uh, This is the video anchor. This is the feature anchor in blue. And so what we're doing is we we kind of match the feature anchor with the crazy VVC, but with a very fast like Python implementation and, and, and things. Well, at all, like for most videos, we our compression uh, runtime is 1% of, of VVC in both encode and decode. So we believe it's just like ground zero of what we can do. Yeah. Um, if you are interested, we open sourced our uh, platform that has all those uh, pipelines. We started last year with the video coding for machine stuff. And this year we just released, uh, three weeks ago, we released uh, pipelines for feature compression. Um, again, this is like, uh, if you're interested in this library, but we, like all the pipelines are supported. Uh, for the split inferencing, we have different pipelines for images and videos. And uh, we support all the different uh, models that we need to support for MPA, as well as different codecs if you want to play with uh, different uh, uh, methods. OK, this is, again, uh, for the software. Uh, I talked about 3GPP at the beginning uh, very quickly. What motivates us in this is that other people are looking at it in 3GPP, which means other people are thinking that there's going to be more and more compute happening at the edge of the network, uh, so closer to you. So for this latency issue, in the future, we might have pipelines that rely on nearby devices, not the cloud that is, uh, I don't know, in, uh, in, in the US or something like this. So, yeah. We believe that those pipelines 
may happen in the coming years. Uh, some, of course, already use that, like say Tesla or these guys, they already do, but they don't need a standard because they control everything end to end. What we target here is more like people like us, they, they don't have like five weeks to retrain an LLM or something like that, but they might want to deploy such system, a new application, uh, phone application, also IoT uh, cameras for security or I don't know. Then maybe you need this kind of systems that are agnostic to the task model that you can maybe tune a little bit. Yeah, so we kind of think of this and this is, I'm sorry, this is a little complicated, but this is the architecture they're looking at in this 3GPP um, group. If you look at the red logos, it means that on your network, you have an a, what they call an AI model, so a deep neural network, and it can transmit to deploy in like in both sides, you can transmit some the neural network weights. That's the MPEG and then the thing, right? And we are looking at the at the purple arrows here. And if you if you put my previous um, figure, you can see that it actually it aligns with what they do as well. Like the AI model inference engine. Let's say your image is taken by your camera on your phone. We're gonna do and then part one in this inference engine here. You can the intermediate data delivery function could contain an encoder and same at the network. You can think of okay, this is gonna be the decoder and it does part two. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna conclude on that. Um, it's kind of recent. I know that some people wanted to start some project a couple of years ago uh, on it. Um, but it takes some time for the industry to also see if it's just a research trend or if it's something that makes sense um, to deploy. Um, it's fairly new for me because I spent my time at Technicar before and I was participating in, in VVC standardization. VVC is it's clear. The industry needs an interoperable encoder decoder. Uh, so the need is there. Here, it's more like, or trying to guess uh, what is going to make sense in the coming years. Um, but again, like standards aside, in terms of research, it, it's pretty clear that the um, sheer number of bits are gonna be transmitted for um, machine vision tasks and not human eyes anymore. So it makes sense to, to, to look at it. Um, uh, I said that already, I believe a little bit more in FCM, so feature compression than VCM, because I feel like it enables new pipelines, whereas the other one is just, they have to show that they are better than VVC other than that, and by a lot, because when, you, when you're telling people you need to deploy new hardware, new structures, new system level uh, things that you need to show that there's an evidence for that. So you need to gain like, I don't know, 50%, like a reliable 50%, let's say. And it's interesting because uh, downstream standards like 3 gpp and ITU are also looking at it. Uh, and I will take your questions. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, Clean it from the field, so it was quite interesting to see uh, all this uh, spectrum. I have uh, something that was not really clear for me in the proposed methods that you've done. You group channels. Uh, is it something that you, uh, the grouping is something that you evaluate uh, every time that you receive new channels, or is it something that, you, that is pre computed? You make some assumption about which channels are going to be. Oh, I see. That's that's a good question. So this grand matrix, uh, with we for images, of course, we're gonna compute it for every image, uh, and we have this very small. I said like we have a very small red distortion optimization loop, so we decide or not to to perform this grouping or not. But for videos, um. It's not there yet, but of course you can perform it maybe only for keyframes and rely on it for the next frames. In that case, you you gain some encoding time. And as I said, for the videos, you know the the feature maps they are so small uh, that it makes sense sometimes to 
uh, keep what you decided for keyframes for maybe I don't know, like maybe sixteen frames or something like that. You you're still doing a good job, but because um, what changes is the video, but the task network is the same. The 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 you know the vision model. So the features convolutions that it has to extract features are the same. Uh, which means that it's kind of probable that the similar channels will also be the same along the video because the the same filters will perform, right? Do yes. you have any questions about these uh, three tensors or two transmits? Uh, I didn't understand where does it come from. So is it specific to a task? Is yeah. it something that will change uh, uh, yes. soon? Yes, if I if you will go back to um, to this, for instance, like a lot of people are looking at uh, fairly simple models like ResNet or things <laughs> like this, uh, where you would have only one tensor. Um, problem of MPEG is they they had to decide on um, models and data sets that they could work with, which means uh, uh, it's kind of stupid, but like copyright issues because a lot of data sets are like we're well, okay for research, but you cannot you cannot do standardization or make money with them. We had to fall back to this SFU data set for video at the very beginning that was uh, done by now my colleague in, in Eto Digital, but he was at SFU because it uses the YUV sequences from MPEG. So it was clearly a good, a good data set. And then the models that, that could be run, um, used and trained because those models are pre-trained. Um, yeah, same, it was very limited. Um, and also they wanted to show models that are kind of state of the art, because if you just show we can do something with either an old model or a small model, um, people will say, yeah, but is it working with state of the art models? So in the end, they came up with this crazy architecture that I showed. Um, um, yeah. Um, because these models are the ones that perform best this. And this is for classification. This does object detection, um, object instance segmentation, and it's also the base. You know, the object tracking is actually two parts. It's like first there's object detection, and then you track along the things. For object detection, it's another one is called JDE, and the base is a YOLO version 3. But it's similar. It has three tensors to transmit instead of 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 four. So which is so the the faster CNN on the encoder side is pre-trained with fixed uh, weights for all the tasks. Is it right? Um, or are there different weights for the different tasks that you want to consider? Very good question. Different for different tasks, but um, but that's not that's one thing that people are going to look at. Can we reuse uh, the same features for different tasks. That's the case for, because mask RCNN for object segmentation can share the same backbone as uh, faster RCNN, yes. Okay, but the plan is to, to standardize or to allow the, the encoder site to have different weights for, the, for this uh, network, depending on the task that you want to. So the task is out of our scope. Yes. And and yeah, the encoder, in my opinion, should be able to handle any sort of feature. <laughs> and that's gonna be it's it's very new. Like next meeting in January, people are gonna argue that you can do this and that. But um, again, if you if you want to have something that you can deploy, you need to tell. Um, the guys who's gonna implement it, um, it's it's fairly interoperable. You can you can run the same system. Uh, you can implement it so you know what is your limit in terms of memory, in terms of, um, of graph transforms and so on. Um, it's going to be more reconfigurable than 
the traditional stuff because maybe you can reuse the the graphic unit of your phone, not not the dedicated uh, uh, encode and decoder. So again, I, I'm guessing in your lab you're looking at this. Um, right now, a phone has some dedicated right uh, um, part of the the CPU for VVC. HEVC, AVC, uh, AV1, that is the one that from uh, the open uh, islands. But if if someday the, the trend or two encoders actually outperform them, it's going to be a very different ecosystem for us and for them because you can reuse the same uh, silicon for your vision model and your codec and you can reconfigure there's going to be more software-based stuff than uh, than what we're doing now. Um, this is not really my specialty, so. <laughs> so thank you for whoops for the presentation. <laughs> so uh, in the sense that so we to be agnostic to the task is that you get you you process data that are quite generic and that can handle many tasks. And then your encoder, the encoder that you propose is also somehow also agnostic. You take this feature and you try to compress them. Yeah. But then you have a kind of rate uh, distortion, but it's not normal, or, or rate uh, yeah. accuracy optimization. And this accuracy is task, is task dependent, right? Not really in our case. It, we're just okay. uh, doing um, uh, MSE or at least some um, uh, like intermediate loss on our uh, features, we're not looking at the end task. Okay. Actually, these models, like if you're looking some, so some people are doing right end to end. Um, it's very um, time consuming, yeah. like to look at the end accuracy and back propagate everything. Uh, and yes, is it up and I understand that this is up and um, tr uh, training, but during the test. Okay, okay. So you, but our, our system is not trained. Yeah. But you, uh, yeah, it's, it's not trained. But uh, everything is when, online. When you use it, you optimize it for a task, or 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 what you say is that what you use. As so the big is a MSC yeah. with uh, between the, the features. The big difference between so all the people are using PCA to do the same thing, principal component okay. analysis. Yeah. That that's the same idea. Right, group grouping channels, or we cannot we cannot use the n accuracy as our metric to perform the audio. It's not like it's not like VVC. We don't have the time to decode because other than I mean the game the game here is to offload the compute. If to perform your audio, you need to process the whole network to get your score back. That means you offload nothing. <laughs> so you need to have some uh, local uh, loss on your current features to try to guess that you're going doing a good job. And you approximate it with the MSC. Right you... now, y yeah. And how? Yeah, yeah, but uh, at the end, so when when there is a battle at the, <laughs> at MPEG. You uh, you show with the end performance with an accuracy, right? You had a accuracy versus rate. Yeah, at, the, at this time we we <laughs> perform encode decode the whole pipeline to okay. get the. But at the encoder, okay, at the encoder, yeah, yeah, we don't have we don't have the feedback, right? But in the CFP, so what is what do you have to uh, according to the CFP? What do you have to show? It's accuracy versus rate. Right? Yeah. Okay. So okay. at the CFP last week, they decided okay, this. This uh, proposals are performing super well. We're gonna use this, the one I showed, as um, as like a reference. But at the CFP, it's CFP is not only like what what's the best. It's what what is gonna be used in the different core experiments. They decided there's gonna be three core experiments. One is for uh, the ones I detailed. Like one is for trained end to end. One is for trained reduction, but um, traditional codec as an inner codec. And the last one is non-trained at all. And then the goal is going to be like, are we designing profiles, maybe a base profile that is fully agnostic and low complexity and some higher profiles with maybe trained method, but the, the, 
they will have the challenge to show that the training is light, um, the adaptations are light, uh, maybe you can do meta learning, things like this. This is the next phase. We don't know yet what it will be. Yeah, we were happy just for what we got, which is we had bad results, but our software is the test platform that was decided. My colleague is software coordinator and I coordinate the C2 uh, that we're interested in. So we'll see how it goes, but at least we can um, drive people towards something that makes sense for a standard, not only compression performance. Because compression performance, maybe it's not what you look for. The guys at the 5G, uh, the 3GPP guys, they're not even looking at compression. They're looking at, can, you, can we just transmit those features? Maybe we have the bandwidth. Maybe the, the goal is just to offload some compute, but it's good to introduce some codec in it to, um, so MTEC don't bias the, the like by default, <laughs> you want like 90% uh, bitrate reduction is the first thing you're gonna look at, but we want to enable a new pipeline. It might not be just compression performance. Um, you mentioned that uh, you are looking at the pixels, even, even if, it means, if it means nothing and the accuracy basically on the whole pipeline, but are you looking at complexity? Yeah. And basically, yeah. The, yeah. everything that is proposed yeah. is quite complex yeah. compared to VCM, for example, it's, uh, if you use a former standard. And is it part of the common test condition? Or? Uh, we're going to make sure that it's part of <laughs> Yeah. Okay, because yeah. otherwise, uh, I mean, if you offload some computation that you mentioned, if you do something even more complex on your on the side of the code, it is meaningless. Again, like my our solution, it looks big on the on the figure, but it runs that the runtime is one percent of the runtime of VVC, so it's kind of fast. Uh, what what is your feeling about? Uh, I like the story about the split uh, uh, computation, uh, but it needs to have strong argument because if the split point is uh, a bit blur, for example, we can wonder why. Uh, you don't do the rest of the net network at the encoder and you just transmit the result of your objective detection. Or at the contrary, why your big point is not at the at the left side and in fact you just transmit your objective. So with your experience or with the discussion with the colleagues, how strong is this split point? Is this a, a story that is valid in a sense? Or not? I come from video compression, so I had to talk to many people to try to guess if um, Maybe I have one example. At 3GPP, um, other companies come for come with um, yeah, some um, applications uh, of of things they like. Samsung came with uh, with the use case. Qualcomm came with the use case. Uh, so we're trying to get that. I mean, our company doesn't. We don't have any product or licensing company, so we rely on the others to come with uh, this kind of ideas. Um, I I spent one year with the exact same question in mind, like where yeah, it's a nice research topic, so it's good for us. <laughs> uh, there are uh, maybe I don't remember like 50, 70 people in the room, so well, a lot of engineers trying to find a job for themselves. Um, but but it isn't going to be deployed. Uh, that's not for sure. Um, yeah, it's a bet. It's a bet. But since like it's easier to bet on something when you have two like ITU and three GPP also working on it, uh, than if it's just MPEG. Uh, like when MPEG decided this NMC stuff, I, that's when I moved to the US. So when I moved, the idea is uh, over there, it's called the AI lab. I was coming from traditional video compression. Uh, so uh, the idea was let's bring one guy from France uh, that has traditional video compression background and uh, talk to the AI experts over there to do some end-to-end -end image or video compression. But then this thing happened, which which was a neural network compression, and a couple of colleagues over there I had something on that, so we decided to go. Again, same like, how come MPEG is gonna tell everybody that uses uh, deep neural network how to compress them? Um, deep neural network is not just for videos, for everything. Um, 
you have to, but now we can see that when they're looking at an VVC plus deep neural network based filters, and there might be some biases or parts of the filters that you can transmit with the bitstream. And then de facto, they think of NNC to do that. So that means the, this IP that is in NNC maybe makes sense now. Uh, it might be the same with this kind of stuff. I feel like this might be a V1. <clears throat> um, like every year, there's a new kind of vision model. So maybe like it feels like it's not a big bet for Interdigital to have two guys working on that and have like ground um, IP if there's a train to catch later uh, on this kind of, of pipeline. The, the story will be more solid if uh, uh, there is a target of kind of universality as uh, I was uh, asking. Like if you try to transmit a compact representation that is, uh, enables many tasks, then of yeah. course we, we, we don't care about the split point. It will not be a, a debate of complexity, but on really something about like uh, reducing the dimension to have something. Else. So that's yeah. the end goal of uh, of my colleague. So he did his PhD thesis uh, at SFU on that, like uh, uh, yeah, feature for multiple tasks, including vision task and or human uh, like vision. Um, so we already in compressed AI vision, we we have his pipeline from his PhD uh, is this that, uh, yeah, that's the end goal. But that's, I think that's, you can have, to have that directly. It might, might be the V3 of our standard, yeah. Right now it's split like this. Even like VCM, the, the video coding, you could think maybe we don't need to decode, right, the pixels. We can take the video and code, and at the decoder, we can just like get some features or things like this. But it's hard to, at MPEG, it has to be a competition and to design something. So if you change the common test conditions at every meeting, you need to freeze something at some point. So that's why it's like this.